So we've been tapping into different uh, gifts uh, to minister this particular subject, and um, it is a subject that I feel like we need to be reminded of probably more than any other subject. So um, Tyler's going to come, and he's going to bring us Lesson 3. So uh, give Tyler a hand tonight. How's everybody this evening? The, uh, the topic that I get to teach on was, was about uh, when you have to serve somebody who is not honorable. And, and so the, the study went into Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, it kind of went through that. And, uh, but you know, it, it says... In Romans, all right, here we go. Luke 16, verse 13. It says, no one can serve two masters, for one will hate one and love the other. You will, de- you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You know, kind of whenever I was told which topic I was going, I was, there was two different directions that I could go. And so I started planning on one. Will you turn me down a little bit, Casey? I started planning on one, and then God changed directions with me. So uh, in, in, the, in the mornings, I usually drink a pot of coffee. And then I'll have, throughout the day, one or two energy drinks to keep me going. And uh, unless God tells you something, it's not a sin to you. But once he tells it to you, then it becomes one if you disobey. So God told me that what I was doing was defiling my body. And that hit me kind of hard. Because I was going off of everything that I could do to be able to get through my day. So just like that said, we can't serve two masters. Was I serving God or was I doing whatever I could do to go out and make a dollar? Who was I trying to honor in this? And uh, so if, if you guys will turn with me to Daniel chapter 1. I'm going to start out in verse 3. Then the king ordered... Ashpenaz, his chief of staff, to bring, bring to the palace some of the young men of, of Judah's royal family and the other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. Select only the strong, healthy, good-looking young men, he said, and make sure that they're well-versed in every branch of learning and are gifted with knowledge and good judgment, and they are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. Then the king assigned them a daily, a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. And they were to be trained for three years, and then they would enter the royal service. But Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were four young men chosen, all from the tribe of Judah. And the chief of staff renamed them with these Babylonian names. Daniel was Belteshazzar, Hananiah was Shadrach, Mishael was Meshach, Azariah was Abednego. This is where I want to get to. But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to him by the king. Have we looked at our lives and said, what am I doing that's defiling myself? In my relationships, in my habits, in my job? Who am I serving? Because, you know, defiling ourselves doesn't have to be alcohol or nicotine or drugs. It can be food. It it can be whatever is getting on the inside of us and, and making us impure. Our music, our TV, what we're reading.
To defile means to, to pollute, to stain or to soil. To pollute, to stain or to soil. Whenever these guys got to the temple, how much pressure was on them? Not to the temple, but to the palace. To eat these things, to drink these things, to obey and to fit in with the crowd that was around them. Tremendous amounts. The guy in charge of them said, he said, if I allow you to eat these vegetables and do these things, and you, you guys lose the shininess of your face, you get thin, they can kill me. So what, what did these guys have that was able to persuade the guy in charge of them to test them? Let us do this for 10 days. It's, it's all right if this is interactive tonight. They had to be passionate about what they were asking, right? Do you think that they went up to that guy and they said, Sir, we are so devoted to our God that we cannot defile ourselves by eating these things. I, I was studying, and, and the wine and the food and everything that they were giving them, it was stuff given to the other gods that, that they served in that country. So it was, it was the sacrifices to the little g-gods. And then they were wanting them to eat it because that was what was brought to the palace for all the king to eat. It was the best. In our life, is anybody going to know what we're passionate about? What we, what we will do no matter what to honor God? So now let's turn over to Daniel chapter 3. So, most all of y'all know the story. King Nebuchadnezzar, Nezer, he made a, a golden statue. And then he, he proclaimed throughout the country that whenever you hear the instruments playing, you're going to bow down and you're going to worship this statue of me. So now we are going to jump over to verse 11. Chapter 3, verse 11. It says, that decree also states that those who refuse to obey must be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you have put in charge of this province of Babylon. They pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods, and they do not worship the golden statue which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage and ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. When they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the golden statue that I have set up? I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue that I've made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? And say, I like this. I don't know if your Bible says it or not. But my Bible says that whenever the king is saying this, and then what God? That's a little g. Nebuchadnezzar did not put God but as God. He thought that the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was just some common God like what, was, what they were serving there. Verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. What do y'all think about that? We do not need to defend ourselves before you. Why aren't they being defensive? Yeah, Arthur. Right. Are you guys willing to suffer to serve a God that you know is good? Are you willing to be ridiculed to serve a God that you know is good? Are you willing to lose your job to serve a God that you know is good? So this is what they said, verse 17. For if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God, big G, 
whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want you to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you have set up. Did they disrespect the king? No. But they told him who their God was. When things happen in our life, in our daily life, do we get all upset and start defending ourselves, defending our stance, where we're at, what we're doing, and why we're doing it? Or do we say, all right, God, I know you got me. And no matter what, I'm going to serve you. Now, I want you to remember back, when they got to the palace, they were tempted to fall in and, and be just like everybody else, to eat what they ate, to drink what they drank, to, to hang out and done what they done. But did they do it? No. They set their self apart for God. How can we do that in today's society? How can we be set apart? How about our music? What we read? What we watch? And for myself... What am I putting in my body? Do I love myself enough because I am the temple of God? Because the Holy Spirit, because Jesus lives on the inside of me, do I love myself enough to not defile my body? It was was new to me. You know, you get to the point where you live life and you just don't care. You just go. You just eat. You do whatever. But uh, it it also says. This is pretty good. We got this at the men's fellowship bill. Romans 623. Let them flash it up there. Uh, I shouldn't have done it in the message. Can you go down to the next one? Or is that it? Uh, go back because right there in the middle is what I want Romans 6 23 for the wages of sin is death right there it says work hard for your sin work hard for sin your click it your whole life and your pension is death so we'll put that together when you work hard your whole life for sin your pension is death Our wages. Whenever we sin, there's consequences. But you know, whenever we're eating what we're eating, whenever we're doing what we're doing, living how we're living, God's not giving us these wages. We are. He he told us that we need to choose either life or death. And we do that by our tongue, but we also do that by the choices that we make every day. Who we're going to serve, what we're going to do, how we're going to live. This, this really bothers me a lot. I, we, we've been able to, to be in different communities and, and, and hear things. And there's, there's been families who have lost a child. And they, they preface what I'm saying. In John 10.10 10 it says, The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come to give you life and life abundantly. God did not come down to kill your kid to take it to heaven. The devil done that. Our thinking gets warped. But you know, this is, this is one of the things that we have to say, I'm, I'm, that, that's not my God. My God's a life-giving God. My God doesn't give you cancer to teach you something. My, my God doesn't give you diabetes to teach you something. So maybe I need to look back into myself and how have I been defiling myself that that is my wages. It's death that I'm putting on me. My words. My choices, my friendships. So tonight, what are we willing to do to cleanse ourselves?
So point number one is we live in the world, but we are not of this world. So let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. So it says, because we have these promises, dear friends, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that can defile our body or spirit. And let us work toward complete holiness because we fear God. So th does that fear, does that mean that we're afraid of God? Or that we hold him up in respect and honor and that, that we don't want anything to make less of who he is or what he's done in our life? Read that again. Because we have these promises, dear friends, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that can defile our body or spirit. And let us work toward complete holiness because we fear God. So how, how can we defile our spirit? Does anything pop into your heads? What about we just flip on a TV show? Jesus loves gays and lesbians, transgender. He loves them. He does not love the sin that they're in. But whenever I start watching that, and, and it's just, that's the way it is. That's not the way it is. So I'm defiling myself by allowing myself to watch that and justifying it. Of It's just TV. You know, God gives us the other half of us which completes us. So the way I, I see things and understand things and my wife are totally different. And it's... You know, they have these Enneagrams that tell you your personality traits and what kind of a person you are and what characteristics you're strong in. And I'm, I'm a pretty bold, straightforward person. I don't like to show my emotions or share them, share them. But for me, when, when certain kinds of music, whenever they're speaking death, whenever, whenever they're associating things in your past that you're ashamed of what you've done and they're singing about them, it brings physical pain to me. It really hurts. So for myself not to defile my spirit... That means I don't want to be around them. Because I, that, it brings back those emotions. It brings back those, those hurts that, that I, I want rid of. I, I want to draw the line in the sand. And, and if you cross it, you better be ready. Because I'm not moving. My God's not moving. And this is, this is it. It's life or death. But we choose I'm learning how to use notes. I usually don't do this, but I'm trying to, to get better, make myself better. So there, there was a man, Pastor Mike Sturgeon, he said this. He said, I don't mind my potato coming from the dirt, but I don't want dirt in my potatoes. You know, we live in the world that's full of sin. But we don't have to live in sin. And it's just like a ship. This big steel metal boat floats on top of water when it weighs millions of pounds. And it works. But if you start putting that water on the inside of it, it's going to sink. What are you putting on the inside of you? Second Corinthians 7, 1 Corinthians 7.1 in the, in the New King James reads this way. It says, Beloved ones, with promises like these and because of the deepest respect and worship of God, we must remove everything from our life that contaminates the body and spirit and continue to complete the development of holiness within us. So another way of looking at this, making ourselves clean and pure and finished. Whenever you are baking and you throw all the ingredients in there, in the pan, 
if you don't mix them in, if you just throw them into, you put them in your pan or the the bowl. Thank you. You put all the ingredients in the bowl, swish it around. You put it in the in the pan and you bake it. Is that going to taste good? Why won't it taste good? It's, it's not mixed up. It's not it's not been through the process of making it the batter. Pure is not the right word, but blended. Okay, hey man, I'm getting. I need. I need my help from the cooking section over here. We don't want to have a big mouthful of flour because it, that's not the purpose of the cake. The purpose of the cake is for it to be good, to be enjoyable. In our life, unless we go through the process of purifying ourselves. If somebody comes up and takes a bite of us, they might get a whole bite of enthusiasm, but no bite of love or compassion. So we have to go through the process of of blending all these attributes of who Jesus is. The fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. What's the other one? Huh? I'll go to making a sword. Whenever you're folding a sword up, you have a chunk of metal and you want to make it out. There's impurities in it. So you heat it up in a fire and you pound it out. You heat it up in a fire and you pound it out. What, what are we doing for that? Anything that is impure that will make it weak, we want to take out of it so that it is, so that it is whole. So that it's as strong as it can be. The point I'm wanting to go with with all these analogies is we have to embrace the process of becoming pure. It doesn't matter if you're five or if you're 105. Every day we have choices to make on how we're going to live and what we're going to do. Let's go to John chapter 17, verse 11. All right, well, let's, I'll read 11 in this and let's go to 14 then in the message. So this is the NLT. And it says, now, this is Jesus talking. It says, now I'm departing from the world. They are staying in this world, but I am coming to you, Holy Father. You have given me your name. Now protect them by the power of your name so that they will be united just as we are. Y'all thought about that? The name of Jesus unites us with God just as Jesus and God were united. What is that name? What does the name of Jesus have to do anything with keeping us pure? Any thoughts? Okay. It can run off the weaknesses. It, it, it casts them out. It defends us. <clears throat> what were you going to say, Arthur? Arthur? Right? Right? Amen. Hallelujah for that, right? It's our choice to choose these things. Just like the power of the name, we have the power to speak that name. We have the power to choose. Am I going to stand up and say, Satan, you get behind me right now in the, in the name of Jesus. I plead the blood. I speak life. I declare that you're whole and healed. I declare that sickness is gone in the name of Jesus. Whose authority are we doing it in? Jesus's. What did that authority, where did it come from? 
from God. He whipped the dead, Satan's tail, took the power, took the keys of, of death, and said, no more. Now, whenever we die, we're just into his presence. What do y'all get excited about? You know, pl pleading the blood in, in Jesus' name is not something that we just do when we're in a disaster or catastrophe, when something is terrible. We can talk about the name of Jesus when everything is right and we are thanking Him for having that name, for having that hope, for having that passion, for having that direction. Because of the name, Tyler Griffin can come up here and speak. Because I don't like being in front of people, but God is growing me and changing me. You know, I, whenever I was in, in high school, there's no way I could have done this. The only time that I was able to start getting in front of people is whenever I got filled with the Holy Spirit and I had the, the, started speaking in tongues. The boldness come upon me because it didn't matter who was there, what, what was happening. God's talking through me. And why am I up here? Because I love you guys. Because I want to share the hope that I have through the blood and redeeming power of Jesus. To let you know that you are not alone. That you are not so impure or defiled that the process doesn't work. The process starts with a choice. So point number two. Our behavior should match our position. What does that mean? So through Jesus, through Christ, I am a son of God. How does a son of God act? A daughter of God? Pardon? Like God. like God. So if I'm a son of God, then that means daddy's my God. And I have everything that daddy has is mine, right? So he owns a cattle on a thousand hills. I have access to that. Where's our perspective at? You know, he, he took five loaves and three fish and fed thousands of people. He blessed it, broke it, and gave it out. So when I have need in my life, what do I need to do? I need to bless it and give it out. And then there will be leftovers. I got, we got to go and listen to Pastor Brad talk this last Sunday. And he gave this analogy. And I thought, I wonder if he talked about his wife or talked to his wife first. I thought, I'm going to steal that. But I didn't even talk to my wife. So here, here's the analogy. So I am committed and married to my wife. And the godly way to do it is 100% of the time. But what if I'm only committed to her 90% of the time? That other 10%, I can go and have another girlfriend. I can go do whatever I want to do. Is that right? No. Do we do that with God? All right, God, I'm going to give you, there's seven days a week. I'm going to give you one day. And then the other six are, I want to do what I want to do. No. No. It's defiling us. Our thoughts aren't right. So how, how do we give 100%? Have you ever thought about that? I, I, I want you guys to look on the inside of you. What am I 100% committed to? 100% is a lot. So I, I've, I've been studying this and, and thinking on this and then I get a phone call. And I didn't want to go and do what it was asking me to do. But then you go, how many percent are you? So if, if Jesus were you, what would Jesus do right now? So I got my shoes on, I went and caught a horse, and I went and put the cattle in. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be selfish. I wanted to have it my way and think about me. 
does my behavior matter? So we are not part of this world. We are part of the kingdom of God. Everybody agree with that? So we are ambassadors for God's kingdom. How do we act? What are we loyal to? We should be loyal to God. Every decision we make should honor the kingdom. What is the kingdom? What's y'all's thoughts on that? What is the kingdom of God? Anybody? The well? Will. Amen. Y'all hear that? The will of God? The peace that dwells on the inside of us? So you know, there's... You can either get up every day and you go to work because it's your job. Or you can get up every day and you will fulfill the purpose that God created you for. The definition for purpose is the reason for which something exists or was created. So this, this is how we get over that struggle of am I working for money or am I working for the purpose which God created me for and money is the side part of what, why I'm here on this earth. It gives us perspective. The reason for which something was existed or was created. Purpose. So whenever somebody says, well, I don't know what my purpose is. We break it down to that. Why did God create you? He created you to have a relationship with you and to love you. And He wanted you to love Him and to love others. That's why we were created. In the Garden of Eden, what did God do? He walked with them. He talked with them. He, he let them name the animals. Hippopotamus? He was going, Hippopotamus? Can you imagine that? Just hanging out with God and going, that's pretty amazing. Why does that camel have two humps and that one only has one? So he would tell us. And then we choose to defile ourselves by putting sin in our life because it looked good. And it cost us relationship. Then all through time we went back over trying to get this relationship back. And finally... Jesus says, all right, I, I'm, I'm, I'll do it. He died so we have relationship. What's our purpose? Yes. And a son means we have inheritance. We know the Bible. What it says, we believe. What it says, we do. Commit your ways to the Lord and your plans will succeed. So we're, we're talking about commitment. What does that mean? Does that mean that, that, all right, God, just take over and do whatever you want? No. Because it says in Proverbs 16, 9, it says a man may plan his course, but the Lord determines his steps. Whenever we learn what the heart of God is and we will fulfill our purpose, God will go with us on the journey through life. And that is how we enjoy things. That's how we become successful. That's how we change lives. That's how we live for the kingdom is by taking God with us on the journey. It, go, getting to God is not the destination. He's our travel partner. Whenever we ask Jesus into our heart, we're there. And now we're going together, living in paradise. Says somebody, what is that saying? All days are good, just some days are better than others. Why are they good? Because we have Jesus. Because I know that if I die today, I get to go to heaven. I know that I'm not separated. I'm not alone. I'm not abandoned. I'm not broken. Why? Because he's in here. So how do we not defile ourselves? 
we see ourselves as the temple of God. You want to feed that to Jesus? Does Jesus want to hear that? I know he don't want me to say that. In, in my life, I'm very black and white. Keep it simple, stupid. Kiss. If Jesus is on the inside of me, that makes it a little bit easier for me to make those decisions every day that seem like they don't matter, insignificant. But they do matter. Because it says, let me back up here. That we are the light of the world, right? That's in Matthew 5, verse 14 through 16. It says, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, the lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, that's all I want to go, just to 15. So have you guys ever thought of yourself as this? Whenever you accept Christ, God is light. That that's on the inside of you. So whenever you're loving on somebody, you open your mouth and light comes out. And what does light do? It dispels darkness. It gets rid of it. So when we speak life over somebody, when we speak light over them, the darkness leaves and then they get the opportunity to be filled with light. Jesus. So when I'm putting these things in my life, it's like a little smear of mud. Now, I'm not a halogen light anymore. Now it's just like a floodlight. I go through life, I see something and that I, I don't just shut my eye or go on past it. I, I turn back and look. Another smear. Somebody says something and I agree and I start talking along with them. Another smear. The light's still on the inside of me. But I'm defiling that light. I'm covering it up. Does my behavior matter? 100%. Behavior is how you act, what you do. You know, we get mad at Eve because Eve took the apple. Her husband's standing right beside her. Why didn't he say anything? And then why did he eat? His behavior mattered as much as hers. They both sinned. What are you willing to do to keep from defiling yourself? Uh, let's go to Philippians chapter 4. We're, I'm going to start in verse 6. I'm going to pause before we start in verse 6. How many of y'all have real Bibles that are paper? Does it not feel amazing to be able to have your hand on the Word of God? To feel it. To smell it. To hear it. Technologies are great. But you can get more from a, in my opinion from a paper Bible than you can a digital one. And I, I just, I, it means something to read the Bible, to know where it's at exactly on what page it is and where it's at on the page. It helps you remember things. So anyhow, all right, verse 6. It says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and then thank Him for all that He has done. And then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything that we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true, honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. 
Think about these, think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all that you have learned and received from me. And everything that you heard from me and you saw me doing, and then the God of peace will be with you. Have you guys thought about this in a paraphrase? If you want to see what Jesus is like, follow me. Come with me. Watch me. That's pretty hard. Are we at the point in our life where we have set apart the things that defile us? That we have crawled into the presence of God and that we are shining bright everywhere we go? That we are a true ambassador of the kingdom of God? That's something we need to strive towards. If you want to see Jesus, look at me. Because how many people in this world they don't read the Bible. They don't go to church. But we are ambassadors of the kingdom of God. We are sons and daughters of the king of kings. If you want to see Jesus, watch me. That's not being proud or arrogant. That is setting yourself apart and being pure and holy. When you make a mistake, you repent. Repent. And you always draw back to Jesus. Let's go back to, I'm just going to read it. I'm going to go here in 1 Corinthians 6. Verse 19 through 20. I'm going to read this in the New King James. It says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and whom you are, and who and you are not your own for we were brought, bought with a price therefore glorify god in your body and in your spirit which are god's and we can't serve two masters but how do we only serve the one that's right it's by not serving ourselves it's by choosing god Whenever I go to work every day, I do it to honor God. Whenever I go and, and into a crowd and I say something, I should be doing it to honor God. Whenever I go to the checkout counter at the convenience store and I check out, I should do it to honor God. But the only way that I can honor God is to make sure that I'm not defiling myself and feeling myself so full of impurities that my light can't shine. So it's our choice. Are you ready to look inside of yourself and get rid of the things that are defiling you? To set yourself apart from the world and to shine bright for God. The day is the day. The moment is now. Don't wait till tomorrow. We don't even know if we're going to have it tomorrow. Because as the body of Christ, as Christians, do you want to get to heaven? And Jesus says, man, I've seen how you were living. You go, well, I was going to change tomorrow. It's too late. And you know, the, the part that we're not looking at is the part where we're going to go and get in trouble because we caught God doing something wrong. The part that we need to be looking at is if I'm defiling myself and I'm not in fellowship or union, if I'm living in sin, that means I'm not in the presence of God. That's the part that needs to make us sad. That's the part that needs to make us repent and, and, and look into ourselves and clean out whatever is there. Because I want Jesus in me. I want Him talking to me. Walking with me. I want to laugh at His joke when He says hippopotamus. It's about relationship. I'm going to close with this word. I hear you say that you have, I hear you say, Lord, have your way. So today is the day. 
and you must say what I say. Your mountains will melt away when you say what I say. So look to me and live your life free, free from distress and despair. For I am your hope, your relief, your restoration and joy. And in me you can do all things. More than just get by, you will be overflowing with wisdom and grace and the means to bless. I'm your God and I stand above the rest. I will fulfill and complete what I've started in you. So get ready to go above. You will jump over the traps that the devil has laid out for you. Blessings and, and glory is what I have for you. I heard you say, Lord, have your way. So my way it'll be, and you will live in victory. So hold my hand and let's take a stand. Glory, grace, signs and wonders, you will see. For that's my way, the way of victory. When we will purify ourselves and get right with God, everything changes. It's a choice. If you guys will bow your heads. I just want each one of us to look on the inside of ourselves. And just ask ourselves, God, am I right with you right now? Have I been doing anything that has been smearing the light that you're trying to shine out of me? And if so, God, I repent right now in the name of Jesus. God, forgive me for it. God, just fill me up with your light, with your power, with your presence, with your joy so that I can truly be an ambassador, that I can walk as the son or a daughter of God and honor you in everything that I do. And God, I just, I just thank you. I thank you for this day. I thank you for this service. And I thank you for your word. And God, I thank you that it says your word will not return to you void. So I thank you as, as, as your body, as, as, as your people here, Lord, they draw near to you, that you'll just pick them up and hold them in your arms, that you will love on them, and that you'll just talk to them about why the hippopotamus was named hippopotamus. So God, thank you for letting us know that our behavior matters. And giving us the wisdom to choose every day to purify ourselves so that we don't defile your goodness, your grace, and your salvation. God, we love you. We just thank you for this night. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Tyler. We certainly need to be reminded that uh, in these last days that God's preparing him a bride and she is making herself ready. I'm reminded, I wasn't going to share this, but uh, I just, this morning when I woke up, this doesn't happen real often, but when I woke up this morning, I heard the, the voice of the Lord immediately when I woke up. And uh, he, said, uh, he said, I'm coming soon. That kind of surprised me because there's a lot of people say he's not coming soon. I really don't know how soon his soon is. It's not my soon, that's for sure. But um, he said that and I thought, yeah, in myself I thought, yeah, I've heard that before. And then he said, prepare my people for my coming, and then they'll be ready for anything. And I remember back when I really was stirred up about, you know, Jesus is coming soon, Jesus is coming soon. When we really think that, we uh, live different. And I think we need to be stirred up because these are days that he could come back any day and we need to be ready. But we need to be ready for anything. So stand with me.
Thank you, Tyler, for sharing that with us. It's important for us to learn, to be reminded that there is a, a world out there that defiles, and we should not let it in. I raise a hallelujah.